yeah, I would also maybe uh, use the first uh, two, three minutes to make uh, two announcements. The first one is that we have a new website. So um, here on this slide, you can already find the link. Uh, please feel free to update your bookmarks. So all the new information will be uh, posted here. And second announcement is about the best paper award uh, of 2022. The deadline for uh, proposing the best papers is 15th of March. Um, so I would like you guys to uh, nominate your uh, best papers, your favorite papers that you like from 2022. The criteria is that they should be uh, published um, or be online in 2022 in a journal or um, conference. And uh, self-nominations are also encouraged um, in this. Um, yeah, so it's my great pleasure today to welcome uh, Justa Carpentier uh, to the third TC seminar. Uh, the title of his presentation is Progress and Prospects in Optimization for Control and Learning in Robotics. I would like to say a few words about the speaker. So Justa Carpentier is a permanent researcher between INRIA and Computer Science Department of École Normale Supérieure in Paris, where he leads the robotics activity inside the Willow Research Group. His research interests uh, lies at the interface of perception, learning, optimization, and control for robotics. Um, he is also one of the main developers and contribu contributors of several robotics software. Among them are Pinocchio and Proxuit, which are quite popular in the robotics community. Uh, in September 2018, Chusta joined the Willow Research Group as a postdoctoral fellow. From 2014 to 2018, he was a PhD student and postdoctoral researcher inside the Chipeto Research Group at La CNRS in Toulouse. Uh, and this is this is the time when I also got to know him uh, because I did a small internship there and it was really a good learning experience for myself. Um, yeah, at this time, his research was devoted to understanding of the computational foundations of anthropomorphic locomotion with contributions in both human analysis and legged locomotion. In 2014, he was a visiting student inside the Optimization in Robotics and Biomechanics group with Katya Mombor at University of Heidelberg. So with this introduction, I would like to hand it over to you, Justa. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, it works. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. I think it's a very nice opportunity to talk with the world community, which is dealing with uh, optimization in robotics. And also, I would like to thank you, the three chairs of the TC, uh, to take care of uh, the community about uh, this topic. And this is nice and very uh, useful, I would say. So thank you very much to all of you uh, to take your time for, for that. Uh, so today, I would like to talk about uh, progress and prospect, uh, I would say, about optimization for control and learning robotics. I won't talk about machine learning really, but I will talk much more on the using um, developing tools, which can be useful also for machine learning uh, aspect. Uh, okay, so uh, I divided my talk in three parts. The first part is uh, about uh, how we can uh, write solvers as roboticists and for robotics. Uh, in the second stage, I would like to talk about uh, recent progress in terms of tools uh, for simulation in robotics and also I would like to conclude my talk with uh, some aspect of uh, differentiable simulations, uh, a topic on which we have been working uh, a lot uh, these past uh, few years. Okay, so first of all, I would like to talk about uh, uh, optimization by roboticist and for roboticist, and how we can use augmented Lagrangian uh, methods approach to, to solve a large class of problems in robotics. So, I mean, this is uh, very uh, obvious that optimization is uh, ubiquitous in robotics in the time that we can use for many problems of the design, simulation, inverse kinematics or dynamics, estimation, and trajectory optimization. If we look at this problem, uh, it's very, uh, 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 the very general topic is the mean national of focus on F according to some constraint J of X uh, to, to be equal to zero and H of X, which will be lower than zero. And this is a very uh, standard problem that is useful to which can encapsulate a lot of problems in robotics and for instance here uh, these are some uh, trajectory optimization problems with the robot r 2 at uh, la cns when i i, I was uh, a phd student and uh, ideally we have a lot of uh, off the shelf server which exists like Gurobi, nitro ipop mosaic and, and a lot of more uh, so like smpt but i would say that the main problem the central issue is that all these solver which have been developed by 
professional in optimization are uh, remain unable to fully address forensic problems as we know all. So this is why a large part of uh, our community is now trying also to develop uh, their own solvers for robotics. And in this uh, presentation, I will talk about the initiatives that we have taken to, to use augmented language techniques to write solvers so for robotics and as roboticists. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned, so Bradley programming is uh, is also ubiquitous in robotics for many problems. So, if we can talk about Kalman filtering, legged locomotions, like uh, using uh, centroidal models or radius models for uh, locomotions, we can talk also about inverse kinetics or inverse dynamics, uh, frictionless contact modeling, and constraint forward dynamics. For instance, all these problems share in common to be a QP, uh, first and foremost. And for that, we have very efficient solvers. Uh, to do that, like Mosaic, Gurovi, uh, which are interoperable methods, but the problem is that they have some limitations, like a difficulty to warm start, and the problem to 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 also provide accurate solutions. OSQP, which is now very popular because it's open source, it's using ADMM techniques, and it's uh, it's uh, it can be very effective at low precision at uh, at uh, loose precision. But when when we want to go to to very uh, low precision, it's it's uh, it's become a nightmare. And we have the most classical uh, tools like QuadProg and QPOSIS, which are active set methods, and which lack of uh, robustness uh, against uh, it pose problem and so on. So I would say in general that modern QP solvers remain enabled to be both fast, numerically robust, and accurate. And this is uh, something which is uh, very uh, stereotypic for QP solvers, and we can be uh, also extended to other kind of uh, optimization problems. And this is why we have decided uh, in the Willow team here at Ingria Paris to work on how we can efficiently solve uh, QP sub problems using augmented Lagrangian. So for that, I propose just to make a, a, a short revision of what is augmented Lagrangian. I, I guess that some of you already know the topic. For, so, for some of, the, of you, you, you won't know, but at least you will get the, the rules picture and I will... Uh, uh, advise you to, to read, for instance, numerical optimization by Nocedal and, and Al, just to get a, a, a quick uh, introduction to the topic. So, augmented Lagrangian is a very old topic in uh, constraint optimizations. And so, the idea comes from SNES OL uh, uh, in the late of 60s, where the idea was to, uh, if we want to solve this kind of problem where we have a construction f of x, we want to introduce uh, the augmented Lagrangian, which is a composition of the function plus the augmentation here, which is the shifting, uh, the shifting of the constraints, uh, uh, and also uh, additionally with the so the shifting of the constraints, sorry, with uh, using uh, uh, the z, which are the multiplier of the problems, and mu is an additional parameter which can be used to uh, penalize uh, the constraints. So this is uh, these additional terms here is a smooth plus shifting penalization. And when we use this kind of augmented Lagrangian uh, formulations, we we then uh, come back to uh, the notion of method of multipliers. The idea that we will do alternating descent between uh, the primal variable x and the dual variable z by doing the optimization just over the primal variable up to an epsilon precision. We just solve the problem in x with a given mu. And then the update is very simple of the multipliers. As soon as we have been able to solve this problem, it's just that we need to uh, increase the current uh, multiplier estimate with uh, the current uh, constraint uh, violations uh, with uh, by taking the max operator here. And then we have some evolution of these uh, principles with the proximal augmented Lagrangian. So the idea of this proximal augmented Lagrangian is just that in, we, we, we still use the augmented Lagrangian that we have introduced before, and we add a, a strongly commixification term, which corresponds to a proximal term, which makes the problem strongly convex and well behaving in terms of optimization over the x variable here. So we just follow the same approach than before, except that instead of uh, they, uh, optimizing over the augmented Lagrangian, we, uh, uh, we, we optimize over the proximal augmented Lagrangian as like, like these things, and which makes a, we can deal with uh, a larger class of problem, and we can show that the problem uh, can converge uh, to, a, uh, to a value for a value of mu, which can be, be non-nil. 
And then uh, recently, we have Gil Renovison, which introduced the notion of a proximal primal dual augmented Lagrangian, which is again an updated version of the proximal augmented Lagrangian with an additional terms, which help us to be both robust and accurate. And so the idea now is not, we don't have a, a, an easy update for the, uh, for the multipliers, but we will try to solve a pr primarily and dually the problem by solving over a merit function here, which is just this augmented uh, Lagrangian uh, function here, where we can optimize over X and Z together, and on top of which we can do a, a, a land search. So in fact, this is exactly this formulation that we will be using for, uh, for building our uh, QP solvers. And so we'll use this merit function and we do some optimization at uh, epsilon accuracy here. We will always accept uh, the uh, update in X and the, the very uh, strong uh, things to make uh, a multi-regression method works is that we need to schedule properly both the precision at which we want to solve the problem and also the effect of the new penalty terms that we have introduced in the uh, Lagrangian terms. And so this is done by, by using the so-called uh, Boudin constraint Lagrangian globalization strategy, which ensures that we have a strict convergence of the, of the problem towards an optimal solution. So this is a very classic uh, technique in, uh, in uh, constraint optimization, which has been used for trajectory optimization by many teams in the world. And in fact, this is a very successful and powerful approach if you want to properly schedule all the hyperparameters of your algorithm to make it converge quickly towards an optimal solution starting from a poor local optima. So, and this is precisely the strategy that we have been using to develop what we call ProxQP, so the proximal quadratic programming solvers, uh, by using so the primary dual augmented Lagrangian together with this BCL strategy to update properly this new parameter and to accurately schedule uh, epsilon k according to the uh, primal and dual feasibility of the problem. So here, uh, I will just introduce you the, the new library that we have been developing. So it's called the Prox Suite library, which is an implementation of the Prox QP algorithms. And so inside the Prox Suite, what we have, it's a, it's a very fast library, I would say that because we are using C++, and we, are also, we have also implemented a non-mate uh, linear Shoesky sol solver, which is uh, much more faster, for instance, than uh, the Eigen library, like four times faster. Well, we have been also working uh, on different backends to work with uh, dense, sparse, and matrix-free uh, optimization techniques, so meaning that we can deal with dense matrices, sparse matrices, and also uh, matrix-free uh, formulations. It seems to be very, very friendly to use because we are uh, we have, we have followed the OSQP uh, API, which is very simple to use, and we provide also Python binding and Jira bindings for uh, for code prototyping. And additionally, this uh, library is already so is is already available in uh, under the BSA license, and you can easily install it on your computer, for instance, using Conda, but also other uh, solution from. Uh, uh, available on the Windows, Mac, and Linux. So here, I just want to depict to you some uh, uh, result of uh, by using this technique of augmented Lagrangian techniques uh, to to solve QP problems. So this is very different from other exercise techniques of, uh, of the literature. So for instance, Mosek and Gurobi are internal part methods. So QPOSIS, as we mentioned, and Quadprog are active set, and OSQP is a is uh, Douglas Rashford techniques, like so IDMM techniques. And so what we can see is that we have been solving uh, many uh, problem, uh, QP problems, and we have average results here. So in uh, here we have the dimension of the problem, so like 10, 10 100, and 100 here. And on uh, the other axis, we have the timings. And so what we can see is that there is a lot of solvers. So we have OSQP, which is uh, in uh, yellow, orange here, color, which is very uh, similar, which has very similar performance than the uh, quad for instance, what we can see here. And also, our pros QP is uh, below, like with a margin of uh, 10. So it means that we are, uh, in average, 10 times faster than the, the best solver of the literature, which were uh, OSQP and quad prog. And what we can see also is that so, some solvers like Mosaic and uh, Gurobi. Are not able able to to, to properly solve uh, problems at very fine precision. So here, what we say by very fine precision is ten minus nine. So maybe for a lot of probability problems, this is not useful. But this uh, test show uh, showcase that uh, some solvers are just saturating 
uh, when converging and which can not which can be uh, which can provide some defect when you use that in uh, other applications. So this is for standard QP problems. And also we did that on the uh, Maros Mezaros problem, which is a, bad coll a large collection of uh, of uh, QP problems, uh, very hard QP problems of the literature, meaning that they are ill posed, uh, badly conditioned, uh, conditioned, and uh, with uh, some uh, some uh, troubles in uh, in the uh, underlying uh, algebra. And so what we can see, this is the permanent performance profiles. So we have we we have asked all these solvers to solve. A, a large uh, part of uh, the Maros Mizaros problems uh, on, uh, of uh, given dimensions. And what we can, so the performance profile is uh, something very typical from the um, optimization literature where we you try to benchmark the, the, the difference between uh, a solver and another class of solvers. So, meaning that here, when we read 60% uh, here, it, this means that the Sprox QP solver was able to solve. Was was the best to solve 60% uh, of the of the problems, and when we go at value two here, it means that for 80% of the problem, uh, the prox QP solver was at uh, most uh, two times uh, slower than the best uh, solvers. So this is a very uh, useful uh, graph just to picture how a solver behaves compared to the best solver of of uh, for a given problem. So what we can see is that from this curve is that the ProcQP is able to solve all the problems at a given precision, while a lot of solvers are just saturating. Here they are saturating because uh, we push a time limit of 1,000 uh, seconds, if I remember well, which means that after 1,000 seconds, if they don't succeed, uh, we stop. And this is a very uh, uh, informative curve just to understand that a lot of solvers of the literature, even if they are commercial like Gurobi and, and uh, Mosec, they may not provide something which can be uh, reliable for uh, hard applications. And in robotics, we have uh, hard applications. So I just want to mention to you an initiative by uh, Stéphane Caron also about uh, the fact of uh, using, of uh, developing uh, uh, QP solver benchmarks with a lot of uh, solvers, as we can see on the left here, which allows uh, each uh, newcomer in the field to just benchmark his problem uh, within the, with a lot of uh, available uh, solvers and also to picture all of to, to, to provide pictures on uh, the benefits and advantages of solvers compared to others so i think this is a very nice initiative for us in the community to have this kind of tools just to have a fair comparison between all these things to, because uh, often when we provide a benchmark in the in our papers we just we just focus on a single uh, type of problem which are not uh, uh, covering all the type of problem that we can uh, on with the solver and so if you have a solver, a QP solver uh, of your choice and you want to add it, it's very easy to, to, to have it uh, uh, the plug to this uh, benchmark as soon as it's, it, there, there is a Python binding. So just to mention this, uh, these things. And uh, also to mention that uh, the solution that we have decided to develop for solving QP solvers can also be used for uh, solving closed loop uh, uh, kinetic system or bilateral uh, with system with bilateral constraints. This is the case of many modern robots like CASI, Digit, or Kangaroo from uh, PAL Robotics, and so Digit and CASI are uh, also very, very well known. So what we have developed uh, like two years ago is a proximal and sparse uh, solver for solving constraint dynamic equations. And we have been using, in fact, the same recipes and uh, what I've mentioned so far. We just need, we don't need, in fact, to, to, to use um, the VCL algorithms for uh, globalization because uh, the problems are often well posed. And we can also export some specific features of the dynamics of the robots to be able to, to solve the problem. And so this leads to, uh, to uh, this has, everything has been implemented in Pinocchio. So I think you, uh, most of you know Pinocchio, which is something which is open source and highly efficient for simulation planning and control in robotics and biomechanics. It's also now used in some civil engineering uh, software, so which is a good thing that uh, we are able to to also uh, feed other uh, uh, field of research or domains. Uh, so just briefly, so Pinocchio, uh, I just want to highlight the fact that it's an efficient, uh, it's implementing efficiently for the inverse dynamics by re revisited Fierston algorithm. We have uh, analytical derivatives of main standard algorithm, plus now we have, uh, thanks to the work uh, of uh, Patrick uh, and his colleagues uh, of uh, tensor uh, computation for uh, inverse dynamics. 
We also support automatic differentiation, code generation, and this is also very highly tested. And we are trying to to, to match the 100% of testing of the codes to to help uh, industrial partners to to use it uh, for real applications. And so these videos, for instance, are just illustrating the use of uh, constraint dynamics uh, server, for instance, on the robots, and which I can depict very low timings, so very set of their timings for the different kind of uh, robots. Uh, so just to mention that I won't go into the detail because I want to to uh, to emphasize on other uh, important facts I think for the for the community. But we, in fact, the, the recipes that we provided for QP problems can be extended to for dealing with uh, non-linear programming problems on manifolds. So which is very essential for robotics because most of our problems are also uh, lying on manifolds, both for the cooperation space of the robot, but also for other uh, perspectives. And so we have been developing uh, Proxy NLP. Which is an extension of ProxQP to deal with nonlinear programming problems in general, and the same thing can be done, in fact, for uh, on, on the constraint in, optimi uh, in optimization and optimal control. Uh, so, uh, so we have been developing uh, ProxDP, which is an extension of uh, ProxNLP to work with trajectory optimizations. And so, we have these two papers. If you want to to have the details of how it works. But uh, we have a plan uh, to release all these things, all these tools to help the community to move forward in terms of uh, trajectory optimization for robotics. So this is uh, just a small illustration of using uh, Prox DDP for doing implicit uh, dynamics. So we, we hear the dynamics is just implicit and not explicit. And we are able to handle the implicit dynamics using, uh, using this, formula, this uh, kind of methods. And this is another illustration where we can do a trajectory optimization with obstacle avoidance uh, as uh, illustrated here and uh, this is very simple to use and it's uh, it's uh, in fact it's also pluggable with uh, crocodile and so on which is uh, the unconstrained version of all these algorithms so i hope i was not too fast on this topic but i just i wanted to advertise you on the on this topic of uh, developing uh, optimization server by robotics and for robotics. Uh, if you want more details, we can have a longer discussion on, on the topic of having tutorials to very depict all the details of uh, the implementation and uh, which are needed for uh, having precise solver. But now I want to move up a bit more on uh, recent progress for in simulation and on the way we can use optimization to revisit uh, classic algorithms. So uh, I think everybody is aware on uh, that simulators are very important for robotics and also aware on the pipeline for uh, inside simulation. So we have, in general, uh, three main steps in a, in a simulator. We have the collision, collision detection parts, uh, which uh, correspond to finding the contact points. And then we have the collision resolution parts, which is using the physical principles uh, to, to compute the contact forces. And from these contact forces, then you do time integration steps in order to update your quantities, like position and velocity of your, of your robots. So this is a very uh, fundamental block uh, in robotics. So we have been working a, a bit on this aspect by developing a differentiable simulator uh, that I won't detail here, but uh, just to, to highlight the fact that it is based on Steiger projection algorithms. So Steiger projection is a technique developed in computer graphics for uh, solving contact problem. And in fact, which seems to, to, uh, to work uh, well for doing uh, uh, correct simulations. In fact, we have been using so Stagger projection is solving a cascade of QP problems. We have extended it to solve, in fact, a cascade of QC QP problems. So, accounting uh, for uh, real conic constraints. And the advantage of QP or QC QPs is that this is, this is a differentiable uh, uh, solvers that we can differentiate, differentiate easily. And so, by uh, differentiating each stage of the Stagger projection algorithm, we can get uh, derivatives out of that. And for instance, to, to, for doing uh, physical parameter identification from real measurements. So this is one of the, of the topic uh, of research that we are uh, doing here at INRIA Paris. But another topic that we'd like to, to talk with you today is about collision detection and to see collision detection as an optimization problem. So often, uh, collision detection is assumed to be a, a problem for, uh, for uh, not really an optimization pro procedure. But in fact, it can be cast at this at this one. So, for instance, when we want to detect the collision between two geometries, we will take the the convex envelopes of these geometries and we work out of these uh, convex envelopes to find the most 
closest point between the two geometries. Often we so we we work with convex approximation to simplify the problem, and uh, we, we try to find x one star and x two star, which are what we call uh, uh, witness point. Uh, and in fact, this problem, uh, when you work with uh, convex shapes, is a convex problem, which can be uh, formalized as this one, where we try to want we want to minimize the distance between x one and x two, knowing that x one should should belong to the first object and x two should belong to the second object. So this is a, a convex problem, as I mentioned. And when you work with meshes, you can take the implicit formulation for meshes here, for instance. A1, X1 lower than B1, and A2, X2 lower than B2. And this formulation is, uh, is a QP, in fact, nothing more than a QP problem. So we can take our favorite QP solver, like Prox Suite, uh, Prox QP here, and we can try to see, to understand if, this, if, if we work with a, a, a box or more complex geometries, and if we take uh, a number of vertices like eight for a, cube, for a cube, and for this geometry it was 250 and 940, we have a number of faces which is growing with the number of vertices, of course. And what we can see also is that the, um, the timings for, for solving the contact problems is also growing. So we for, for a very simple box, it's just uh, uh, sag five, five microseconds. But as soon as we, we go to more complex object, it goes up to uh, to the millisecond scale, which means that we cannot use this solution if we want to do simulation at very high frequency, like in reinforcement learning or also in um, trajectory optimization. And for that, the community, the, community, uh, the uh, computer graphics community have developed uh, the JDK algorithms, uh, which is very, very efficient. So it's a 40 years old uh, algorithm, more than 40 years, in fact. And uh, which is which seems very reasonable to solve uh, complex collision detection problems. So this is JGK, which can solve for very complex shapes, something in just two microseconds. And what we have been doing so far recently is to uh, rethink JGK algorithm, which is a very uh, which I'm, I mean which which were formulated in, in an algorithmic manner, but not as an optimization uh, procedure. But if you do so and you use recent progress in uh, in optimization, you can accelerate the algorithms to get something which goes uh, even more uh, quicker and uh, which is much more uh, rapid to to find uh, contact uh, witness points and to to find if two pair of collisions, if two objects are in collision or not. And so, uh, in this talk, I would like to 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 remind you how JDK works, just uh, roughly. To give you the, the main idea of uh, the, the of JDK, because I think it's, this is a fundamental block of of all simulators that you are you, using so far, and knowing how it works is also something to understand uh, the main concept or, and also the main limitations. So first of all, JDK is not working directly in the in the in the frame of the shapes, but in the Mikoski difference of, of the shapes. So the Mikoski difference is just the operation of where we take all the points of A1, and we retract uh, the point of A2, which gives something like this one for two given position of A1 and A2. And in fact, from an optimization perspective, this corresponds to a minimum point problems uh, where we try to find X, so the distance between the uh, Mikoski difference and the origin of uh, the difference. And if the uh, the origin lies within the the Mikoski difference, it means that the two shapes are in collisions. Otherwise, it means that there is no collision and there is a given distance between the origin and the between the, the two the, the two shapes, which correspond to the distance between the origin and x star. Yeah. And so this is a minimum point algorithm. And classically, what people does in uh, in optimization for solving this kind of problem is to use the so-called Frank Wolf algorithms. So this is what we, uh, we will see. And in fact, JDK, uh, I, do, I won't go into the details, but JDK can be seen as a subcase of frank uh, algorithm, which is something very old, so uh, dating back from uh, 56, and which is uh, um, an optimization procedure to solve a uh, problem of this form, where we have uh, a smooth function here, and we have uh, a convex shape here. So this is uh, the iso line of the problem. So here we have the uh, Minkowski difference. We have we are at the current estimate xk, and what we want to find is uh, x star, which is the closest point to the origin belonging to the Minkowski difference. 
And for that, we will do something very simple in terms of uh, implementation for the Pankwork algorithm. So this is only four, line, four uh, line of codes, in fact. And so the, the, the Minkowski difference will first, uh, the, the Frank Wolf algorithm will first look to find a supporting direction S uh, in the direction of the gradient here. So here we have, uh, we are, uh, we, we are the, this point here. We have the iso line of the gradient. And so we are looking for the, uh, mi, the mean direction between the current gradient estimate and S, such S belong to the uh, Mikoski, to the Mikoski difference, which correspond in fact to this point. So this is uh, the point which is uh, in the opposite direction to the gradient and uh, the far west from uh, in terms of this direction and which still belongs to the um, uh, Minkowski difference, which is a convex shape. And so we take this point and uh, what we do is we do a, 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 a line search between uh, the current estimate xk and this uh, supporting point. And by doing so, uh, so we, we do this line search procedure here. And by iteratively solving this problem, we are able to converge towards the optimal, which is x star, which is the closest point to the, to the origin. So this is a very simple procedure. And uh, so what we have been uh, doing recently is that we are showing uh, that uh, GDK is just a subcase of Frank Wolf. And by uh, using uh, recent progress in uh, optimization, we are able to accelerate it. But before talking about that, I want just to talk about this action here, which is very fundamental for uh, GDK, but it is uh, fundamental also for being efficient in terms of uh, 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 numerical procedure to be fast for collision checking. So here, this is the, the problem that we, we are aiming to solve. The, the, the thing is that the, um, the Frank Wolf algorithm is using uh, the support function uh, globally. And so the support function, as I mentioned, is, uh, is uh, given a direction D. This is the, uh, the opposite direction with respect to D, which still belongs to the, to the shape here. So this is the, 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 the green star at this level. And in fact, for many shapes, uh, and for many, many, uh, so like a sphere uh, capsule and so on, you have closed form solution for, uh, for this uh, supporting function. And an important thing is that when you work on the Minkowski difference between two convex shapes, you can uh, easily compute the supporting function by uh, the difference between the supporting function of shape one in direction D and for shape two uh, in, uh, in direction minus D. And so uh, by just knowing the support function of uh, individual geometries, you can uh, work with a large family of collision pairs. So like a sphere with a, a mesh or a um, um, box with, with a mesh and so on. And so this means that uh, the GDK algorithm is able to support a large class of problems. Well, we have seen before that for, uh, for the meshes, the, it was a QP, but if you work now with a cone and so on, this is no more a QP. And this is much more on SOCP problems and so on. While here we have a, a, a single a, a single family of uh, of algorithm to solve a large class of uh, collision problems. And so this is a this, this action is very the essence of efficiency for um, for uh, GDK algorithm. And as I mentioned before, what we can use uh, so the, on the left we have the vanilla GDK, but what we can do is we can use a nested of acceleration scheme to accelerate the procedure. So I, I won't go into detail of, uh, of Nesterov acceleration, but you can find a lot of tutorials on the internet. Uh, the idea is that we will use an intermediate step here uh, to compute uh, the, uh, uh, to compute the direction in which we want to look at uh, for uh, finding here the uh, supporting function. So here we are no more working directly with the gradient of, uh, of FXK, but we are working of an intermediate value, which is a gradient of A evaluated at the point Y key, which is uh, given by the linear interpolation uh, by the line search procedure here. Yeah. And what you can see and what we can observe in general is that if JDK is doing this kind of path, uh, the Nesterov acceleration is able to uh, go quicker towards the optimum. And so we save a lot of uh, intermediate computation and we can go quickly towards the optimum. So in terms of uh, performances, in fact, what we have uh, observed is that uh, for collision taking or distance computations, in fact, 
the, the, the Nesterov procedure is always better for very close proximity shapes. Uh, uh, and we can uh, also uh, have similar performances for the for the distance computation. So we have always uh, the nested of accelerated version, which is always uh, lower than the previous one, uh, and which can be something very appealing for simulation because in simulation we have in uh, overlapping or very close proximity aspect, and so by uh, uh, diminishing the computation times for solving the problem, we you are able to save times in general for doing simulations. So we have another ici uh, benchmark. So for instance, for different shapes. So for instance, here we can see that we, we can uh, lower and uh, up to uh, divided by two the, the timings for JGK, which is something, as I mentioned, very appealing for, uh, for uh, simulation. And the small question is that, uh, okay, we are saving like two microseconds. But the thing is that we sh should keep in mind is that when you do simulation of very uh, dense sim, it means that with uh, like uh, Android objects, then you need to uh, multiply this saving of computation time by the, by the uh, Android squared divided by two number of objects to get something which is uh, so like uh, you can save like one second of uh, of computation time for uh, large simulations. The, um, also to mention that all these features have been implemented in, in an extension of the S, uh, of the original FCL library, what we can call FCL++, but we don't have any naming for that, but which is called HPPFCL. So you can, again, easily install it. And all these things are, have been detailed in this uh, paper, which has been published last year in, at RSS, and uh, which is uh, also doing a, a general overview over the JDK algorithm. I think uh, if you want to, to understand JDK, by reading this paper, you are able also to, to get a, a good tutorial, I would say. So now I will move on towards differentiable simulation for robotics. Uh, and the question is uh, how to deal with uh, the inherent smoothness of uh, simulations. So just to, to remind you, so this is the main uh, uh, pipeline uh, for, for, for simulation. So we have two main steps, which are collision detection and collision resolution. And when we solve collision, uh, when we want to have a differentiable simulator, we need to have these two blocks differentiable. And currently, a large part of the community is dealing with this problem, and just few people or few teams uh, in the community are very looking to this problem, which is also funda as fundamental, I would say, as this one. So just to exhibit the problem of non-smoothness, uh, so we can imagine that we have a cube here that we want to lift the cube to, to reach a target position. Uh, the cube is submitted to gravity, and we have compensation force uh, from the contact interaction of the cube with the ground, for instance. And the thing is that if we don't put an interaction, we just have a little interaction, we don't have any gradient information coming from, uh, from uh, the current control input uh, U, meaning that we don't have any motion, residual motion of, of the cube. We need to compensate and to be low, uh, greater than the gravity if we want to uh, to be able to to have a, a, a simple motion of the, of the of the system, and this is a, a characteristic of non smoothness. So it means that the gradient will be zero, and we start to to have we will start to have information as soon as we have something which is sufficiently large uh, to compensate for the gravity. So this is a very stereotypic uh, uh, issue, but uh, we have a lot large class of problems uh, in robotics uh, dealing with that. And in fact, uh, classic optimization-based methods uh, are likely to fail because if we have a new gradient, it means that we don't have any information to do gradient descent and we won't uh, make any uh, improvements. And so for that, uh, we have been considering uh, randomized smoothing. And in fact, uh, uh, we have been inspired by the work of uh, Quentin Berthe and colleagues, uh, which have, we who have been using uh, randomized smoothing for, uh, for solving uh, non-smooth problem uh, in optimization, this is a, 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 a typical problem. Is this one, for instance, we want we have a max function and we want to differentiate respect to the to theta here. So here we we take uh, just the cross product between y and theta, and we want to y to be uh, inside a convex uh, shape here. So if we take just theta uh, and we want to compute the R mass of respect to y, if this corresponds to to this point. This is like the support function that we mentioned before. Uh, but uh, the, so the idea of randomized testing that we will add a small distribution around uh, around the, the uh, we will add a noise around the current theta estimates, 
And by using this noise, we will get uh, a collocation of the possible solution to different vertices of the constraint set, for instance. And by averaging them, we get a, a smoother information about uh, the, the problem. So this is uh, reminded here. So a bit uh, fuzzy, uh, I would say. Uh, so here, uh, we just take a distribution of this form for the noise. We need to get something which is an uh, exponentiation of, of a value. And so we have uh, the noise and uh, intensity of the noise here. And uh, by, by uh, randomly perturbating uh, theta with respect to this distribution, we can get an expected value of y, for instance, this one, which is an average, uh, weighted average of this uh, distribution to get these points. So we get something which is internally to the convex set. And from that, uh, from out of that, we can also get an estimate of the gradient of these quantities by just using samples uh, of, uh, of the distribution, out of the distribution. And now what we have is something which is, uh, we have a non-null gradient uh, everywhere, which is uh, informative for optimization. And uh, when we see for control, in fact, and uh, so uh, we can use this kind of uh, techniques to uh, to get something uh, out of that. So meaning that instead of working with F, X, and UT for uh, optimal control, so optimal control, uh, I think all of you are familiar with that, but we want to minimize uh, a running cost here uh, and uh, with a terminal cost according to a given dynamics uh, to a given uh, state and the optimization variable are just the control that we need to feed to the system to move. And uh, generally we work with a deterministic system, but we can perturb artificially the system, perturb artificially the system to get uh, something which is uh, randomized. Uh, out of that, we can uh, get a, a randomized uh, gradient, uh, a smooth gradient information to tackle uh, non-smooth problems. And uh, what we have uh, shown uh, in, a in a paper of last year is that, uh, in fact, this is a procedure which is very similar to what uh, most classic uh, RL reinforcement learning algorithms uh, do by uh, when they do uh, the um, averaging of uh, samples to get uh, gradient information uh, for, uh, for, co for computing uh, gradients, and which correspond, in fact, to a zero order method. But in the case of um, of our problems, we can do a first order method, meaning that we have a much more accurate gradient, and we will see that later uh, about a differentiable collision. So, for instance, when you use these kind of techniques, so in blue, what we have is a non smooth problem. So, we have a null gradient, and when we, uh, we are lower than the gravity here, we start to move. So, this is a non differentiable function, and by using the smooth version of the problem, so by putting a noise here in U, we can get a, a smooth approximation of this function, which uh, helps us to uh, to get a smooth gradient to 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 converge. So, if you want to have a take on it, you have this paper, and there is also a parallel paper done by uh, the team of Fristedrek uh, using uh, the same uh, technique, but they don't call it randomized smoothing, but bundle gradients. But uh, this is very uh, uh, in the same uh, spirit. And in fact, these tools, you can use it for, uh, for, instance, for instance, differentiating uh, uh, the process of render, rendering. So this is the work that we have done two years ago on using the same techniques. So for instance, if you take a 3D mesh, it's composed of triangles here. When you do uh, the rendering of this scene here, you need to do a, a projection in the camera plane to get uh, something aligned with, with the plane. And then you do rasterization to have uh, something which is aligned with uh, the pixels. And then you do aggregations. And all these stages here are non-differentiable, in fact. And you can use a randomized smoothing, for instance, to get a smooth gradient to retrieve the variation of uh, elimination of a pixel with respect to the, for instance, to the position of the object in the scene. And so this is something that we have been using, for instance, to do uh, object alignment here, just to recover the position, the orientation of the object according to a given uh, picture. And what you can see is that by adding noise, in fact, the, normally you 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 have uh, some um, uh, defined color on each faces of the box. But when you use randomized smoothing, you have some uh, pixel information which comes in the front, and you have a mix of information. And what is good with uh, differentiable other rendering is that you can see the effect of randomized smoothing. And when you lower the noise, and while you are converging towards the solutions, 
you can see that you recover almost the uh, initial picture, but you still have uh, some noise which perturbs the rendering. But this is something nicely illustrated here. And in fact, you can use exactly the same tools for the differentiating collision detection. And so the, the notion of differentiating collision detection is that we, we have here two, two witness points that we want uh, to be, for instance, aligned. And we want, in fact, when we do that, we want to differentiate uh, the variation of the contact points of this uh, witness point, sorry, uh, by uh, respect to the uh, position of uh, the relative position between the two, the, the, the two objects. And again, uh, this problem has some uh, troubles, so like, for instance, so if you work with strictly convexed there is no problem and everything is smooth. But as soon as you work with uh, boxes or non-smooth, uh, non strictly non, non convex shapes, sorry, you start to have uh, troubles, like uh, you have some witness points which can jump from one, uh, one point to another point, and which can be uh, uh, troubling for your optimization solvers. And also, when you work with meshes, for instance, you have uh, an informative uh, curvature, which means that you have flat surface and uh, which are not providing any information for your, for your problem. And so you can use the similar tool that, uh, which is randomized missing for uh, differentiating collision detection, which is by essence a non-smooth problem. And so we have what we have proposed is two estimates for, for, the, for computing uh, this gradient information. So just you do, so here what is nice also with collision detection is that we can see the operation of randomized smoothing. And so we just when we do randomized smoothing here, we've just perturbed the relative position between the two objects. And by doing so, we have, um, in fact, we perturb uh, the variation of contact points on the surfaces. And from that, out of these points, what we can extract is a gradient information to know uh, what is the variation of the witness point with respect to the relative configurations. And another approach is to use a much more informative uh, quantity to get a first order, first order, first order of, um, approximation. And uh, out of that, in fact, what you can get is uh, to get, uh, you will use, for instance, on the mesh, you will use some neighbor of your current of your current witness point to get an average of the uh, curvature of the, of, the, of the mesh. And for that, you have a closed source formula, which is uh, by using, for instance, the Gumball distribution, uh, and which is very useful if you want to be very fast for differentiating collision. So here is an illustration of using uh, our tools for doing uh, optimization. For instance, you want to have the two yellow points to be uh, to be uh, to 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 be uh, at the same place, and currently you are at this position where you have uh, the witness one, which are the blue points. So you want that uh, for uh, you want to to find t1 and t2 such so that uh, the witness point of uh, the first object is a yellow is a yellow point. The, the witness point of the second object is a, a yellow point here on the green object, and you want to have uh, the two points uh, coincident. And you can use different estimator of the gradient. You can use finite differences or the zero order and the first order. And what we can see here on the on this curve is that if you use finite differences, you you won't be able to converge towards the optimal solution. You will be stuck into uh, something very imprecise. And when, if you use a zero order method, you can start to converge. And it's always better to use a first order, order gradient estimate to converge quickly towards a, a solution, which is uh, almost zero in terms of cost value. Uh, and so this is some timings also. It's important because we are using randomized switching. So it means that we need samples to estimate uh, the gradient. Uh, the gradient. So uh, we can see here the timings. If you so, if we use a small collections of samples between collision and no collision, it, it changes a lot because we are uh, either using JDK or the uh, extended polytope algorithm for for computing the collision, the uh, intersection between the two shapes. And according to, to to this table, what we can see and what we can observe is that uh, it has a cost, which is uh, of course linear in the number of samples. But what is surprising, if we if we use cross form formula like the Gumball solution, we can have timings for collision and no collision, which are very very uh, uh, limited. So like uh, if we use a neighbor of just one, we get something which is just two microseconds to compute the derivatives of the collision detection problems up to ten microseconds, which is very small 
and very scalable for uh, doing differentiable simulation, including differentiable collision. So I will go now towards the conclusion. Uh, so I will say that augmented Lagrangian is a very versatile uh, tool for robotics and uh, because it can handle a very large family of problems. So as we have see, seen, it can be used for uh, solving QP problems, but also for solving NLP problems and, uh, and trajectory optimization problems. Uh, it's also important to just to, to not forget to, 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 to also to go and to look uh, how optimization can help us to, to improve the efficiency of uh, set of algorithm, for instance, in the case of JGK. If you see it as an optimization problem, you can use accelerate, nested of acceleration techniques, for instance, to uh, to get something which is much more faster. And finally, I would say that uh, random smoothing currently is not so, so used by the community, but it seems to be an appealing uh, research direction to deal with non-smooth uh, issues in robotics. So maybe a, a final take is that uh, everything that we have been doing, we are trying to push that in, uh, in our software that we are trying to support and continue and to develop uh, uh, in a continuous time. Uh, so sorry. Um, and so it takes a lot of uh, efforts. And uh, so it's, a, it's not a, the work of a single person, but a, a work of a team. And we are also willing to, to, uh, to get contribution from the community to get at the end a, a common toolbox to, to help us to move forward uh, in robotics and so everything that we are doing is open source for this case and just here this is a picture of the two teams so the Willow team at Inria Paris and the Sierra team uh, during our retreat so and um, so we are uh, we have started with robotics like four years ago in the team and we are trying to move forward and so if you want to join us we are hiring so don't hesitate to contact us to 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 join us as a postdoc or engineer okay thank you very much just now for this great presentation so now the stage is open for discussions. So please feel free to write questions in the chat and or just turn on your microphone and camera and ask directly. So Patrick, you want to start? Sure. Uh, thanks, Justin. This was fantastic. Um, I guess I have a question kind of coming from our first TC seminar series from Zach Manchester, where the differential uh, differentiable simulation problem focusing on collision detection was kind of also a focus there. And it seemed like the way that he was going about it was by, you know, kind of taking an interior point perspective and not cranking down your barrier parameter all the way, but just, you know, leaving it as some small value. And then you would recover differentiability um, in, in that case. So can you, can you kind of hit a high level compare and contrast, um, you know, maybe the pros and cons of that compared to these randomized smoothing strategies? Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you for the nice question. I think it's nice to have the link between uh, all the all the presentation. Uh, okay, so maybe first, um, so uh, the first comment is about using uh, optimization, classic optimization solvers like uh, QPs or QC QPs and so on for solving collision detection problems. So as we have just seen with this picture is that for, for small problems, this can be good. I mean, I, for, for basic primitive, I think it's a good strategy to use off the shelf solvers. But as soon as you start with, to work with large messes like this one, uh, as we can see, even if Roscopy seems to be currently state of the art for many problems, uh, this is not the, the right solution for timings uh, for doing something which is uh, real time. But this is for large problems. But I would say that for small problems, it can be a solution. Uh, so this is uh, the, the first thing. But when you use randomized smoothing, you need to, 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 to use samples, not uh, thousand samples, but something like 10 samples to get something uh, uh, which can be uh, informative enough to, to move forward. And so this is, I mean, the main drawback of randomized testing is that you need to parallelize your uh, computations to get something in average. So, but this is something that, we, that should be adapted along with uh, the optimization procedure. So meaning that when you are far from the optimum, you, you need uh, large sam samples numbers. But as soon as you go quickly, quickly towards the solution, you can reduce the number of samples. So this is something adaptative. Um, uh, maybe the, 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 the good thing of interpret method is that there's a large bit of on the topic and we know how to tune them uh, thanks to IP up the uh, paper. And I will say that out of that, we have already a lot of knowledge. Why the random smoothing seems to be still something not mature enough to be used uh, directly. And it needs a lot of uh, tuning to get something uh, working properly. 
Thanks for the insight. So there is a question in the uh, chat. It says, it is necessary, is it necessary to use the implicit transcription in the use of augmented Lagrangian function in the DDP approach? Uh, of course, no. Uh, so I, 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 my, my take was just to, to showcase that we can, uh, uh, I mean, we can use, we can develop an implicit uh, DDP solvers to, to, to tackle implicit formulation of physics. So like uh, using partial integrators, for instance, or uh, soft body dynamics. Uh, so this is something very uh, appealing for when you want to optimize, you, you can optimize both your dynamics and the problems together, uh, but you are not obliged and you can use explicit formulation for, for, uh, for, the, for the dynamics. And uh, in this case, you recover the multiple shooting framework, which is pretty useful when you are, uh, you are, you are a poor uh, uh, initial guess for your, uh, for your server. Okay, thank you. So maybe I have a more uh, perspective question. Um, I was wondering um, if you see any opportunities for um, hardware acceleration or parallelization in the different algorithms you talked about in your talk. Um, so if we start with uh, randomized missing, of course, if you use uh, GPUs, of course, with uh, threading internally, uh, internal threading, it's of course, uh, you, you will gain a lot. Uh, but uh, I, so I think in the community, there is a lot of, uh, so I mean, uh, Brian uh, has been working a lot uh, on uh, trying to accelerate um, uh, computations by using GPUs computation, and it has shown that you can get something very uh, large improvements. Uh, so my, my take on that is that it, it requires a lot of works. Uh, so what we have started to do for Pinocchio is to, to support code generation on GPUs automatically out of the algorithms. Uh, so we, we are not mature enough to, to propose it to the community, but I think it's, uh, it's something to join uh, the initiative of, of Brian on this topic. Uh, but uh, for optimization procedure in general, I think working with on CPU for us is already uh, uh, sufficiently hard to not move uh, towards GPUs. I and mean, we, we are lacking of experts. Uh, hopefully for people in deep learning, they have uh, uh, the PyTorch Foundation, which helped them to, to move forward. In robotics, we don't have such like an initiative. So we have Drive, for instance, but uh, I mean, this is not as mature as uh, PyTorch, I would say, for robotics. And I would say that in robotics, we are, we are first lacking of toolbox, uh, of uh, decent toolbox to move forward. And everybody is, is uh, asked to, uh, to rewrite his own DDP solver, his own framework, and so on, every time a PhD starts, or almost every time which means that we are lacking a lot of time by just redoing what people have already done. So the initiative that we want to take in the community is just uh, pro pro providing to the community uh, um, state-of-the-art uh, frameworks like Pinocchio, uh, HPPFCL, and, and ProxSuite, on top of which we can build. So everything should be open source, of course. And, uh, and for instance, for FCL, we didn't decide to start from scratch and to rewrite the collision detection library. We took the, the work of Dinesh Manusha and his teams uh, because uh, it was already excellent in terms of uh, scope, and uh, but we, there is a lot of work to do, and we we had to to fight a lot, and uh, notably uh, Joseph Mirabel and Florent Lamiro to make the, the library uh, bug free or almost bug free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for this perspective. So there's another one. Could you comment on the promise of primal dual augmented Lagrangian method over SQP based methods? Not. Uh, for nonlinear programming in terms of robustness and computational speed. So as as an OPT, it was a yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I've been using a bit as an OPT. I think the the, the team of Chris Tedike uh, with Michael Poza uh, have been using also it uh, a lot, and it was not uh, it it was working, but not uh, as the right speed and as the uh, as the right robustness to be deployable on robots. So this is uh, something missing. And I would say that because uh, people that are developing such kind of frameworks are not thinking about robotics problems and mostly they are dealing with much more larger problems beyond robotics and in robotics, we have specific features. At some point we need to have something which is precise or less precise, but also we need something which, need, which can deal with uh, uh, singularities, singular problems and um, and be behind SNPT, you need to have a, a, a QP solver. And if, if the QP solver is not um, robust enough, you won't be able to, to, to attain your, uh, your, your performance. 
And so my guess, my take on that is uh, by working on uh, rewriting optimization problems in the frame of robotics, we are able to uh, save or simplify the, the problems uh, and to get something which is very dedicated for our problem. And I think this is uh, a lot of things that many, many people in the team have been doing. And the first thing was done uh, at least uh, around the hierarchical QPs, for instance, for legal locomotions. And I, I think it was something very uh, useful at this time to look at this problem. And nobody in the optimization pro literature was looking at this problem. We can say the same thing for, uh, for augmented Lagrangian is that there is a promise that it can be a good tool to move forward. Okay, thank you. So, Constantinos, you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, thanks, Stan, for, for the talk. You have a great uh, presentation. I have a question. Uh, you have done uh, a lot of things uh, in trying to see uh, parts of the simulation as an optimization procedure and optimize it and make it better. So how how far away do you think you are from <clears throat> creating actually a simulator that can be fast and accurate and robust, uh, that it can be used by the community and uh, actually be uh, more useful than, you know, individual parts that uh, someone can try to glue them together? So so, uh, so currently, the, the, I would say the main problem is time. Uh, so when you could become a researcher, uh, academic researcher, at least, you are uh, more and more lacking of time. When you're a postdoc, you have time. So I would say that uh, first, don't become too too early. Uh, don't get a panel position too early if you want to be, still have time to, to, <laughs> to develop something. I think uh, everybody can uh, can feel it, can feel it now. Uh, so otherwise, we should remove a lot of constraints from coming from academia to have less constraints. And I would say that this will help us to move towards a, a, a simulator, a generic simulator for robotics. So there is a nice initiative. I mean, uh, now the Mujoko is open source. This is nice for the community. We don't have black box system now, and we have an open source framework. I think we, sh we should keep this thing in mind to have uh, open source frameworks and with uh, available, uh, I mean, to uh, open source because we need to, to know what happens behind and we need to have uh, informative uh, details about what happens. Uh, in terms of Pinocchio then, uh, roadmap, we have, so we have the plan of developing a simulator on top of Pinocchio. This is an ongoing process. Uh, it takes time, uh, but uh, hopefully we, we are making large progress now and we hope to get something uh, ready soon. So this will be uh, hopefully the case uh, rapidly, but it takes time to get something which is both robust and which not which works beyond just simple examples. I, I guess Pat wanted to ask the question next. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, also just a huge thanks for all the efforts in terms of maintaining these softwares for the the community. Um, can you talk us through a little bit in terms of if folks want to contribute themselves to these code bases, what that process looks like? So, so currently we don't have process. I will say that we are taking uh, PRs, I mean, uh, contribution as they come. So, our expectation of, out of that is that we, uh, within RIA, uh, we are trying to build a consortium, a software consortium around robotics. Meaning that what we want is that we want researchers and industrials, we are, we, which, which are using our software, to to, to talk together and to develop together the tools. So because we need tools for us as a researcher, but our tools as a researcher can be used by uh, uh, industrials. Uh, and so for consortium, we want to have something which is much more mature in terms of contribution, something like similar to scikit-learn. I don't know if you know. So scikit-learn, which is a, one of the big framework for, uh, for uh, machine learning. So we want to get something very similar where we can have a staff of engineers which can support the community to to help them in their contributions, to clean the the contribution coming from uh, from researcher and so on, and to have a, a clear roadmap which is defined not only by us as a researcher at Pinaya, but also by researcher in US, in uh, in Europe, and uh, in uh, Asia, for instance. So this is uh, something that we want we we want to 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 create. And so currently, I would say that just contact me and we'll contact people that are responsible as a framework, and we are happy to help you. So recently, uh, from your, your your team, we have uh, the tensor computation, which is very nice for uh, invert dynamics. And for the other frameworks, uh, I think uh, we are totally open, and there is no uh, uh, fundamental blocking aspect. Thanks, Justin. 
I, I guess if we can jump here, I guess this this kind of workshop and activity. Can you hear me? Yeah. Just to the yeah. okay. Yeah. The, I I guess it, 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 we can think about into a, a workshop or something in future where we discuss about a roadmap, and then with a, giving a roadmap, it's it's a it's a bit clearer how to collaborate together and how you know partner with people different expertises. I think that it's something that I'm interested. I'm keen to to join such kind of. Uh, you know, initiatives as well. Yeah, yeah I do agree. So what we currently, what we are missing in robotics is a workshop on tools. There is a lot of workshop on uh, on, um, on progress in terms of science, but not in terms of tools. And we did that, like uh, you did that a few years ago for Optim Optima Control. We did that uh, four years ago uh, at ICRA. But uh, it should be a recurrent uh, event for the community also to 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 drive the roadmap and to get something which is uh, uh, making everybody happy. I would say. Yeah, that's a really good idea, and I think this is something that we can also support as a DC. <laughs> and yeah, we were also thinking to uh, um, introduce an award for best open source software contribution, uh, so that yeah. Uh, such contributions are encouraged um, in the research community. So that's a really, really good idea. Yeah. IROS workshop deadline March 15th. Anybody <laughs> want to join me? I'll, I'll write it up if uh, a bunch of you agree to be speakers from all over the globe. So on my side, I cannot promise to, to take the plane to go there, but I can promise to, to, to be off, uh, offline uh, and to, to, uh, to give a talk. So we'll think about it. Maybe I'll, yeah, yeah maybe we'll, we'll put something together. It, I, I guess like this is my uh, call to the community. If you think that sounds fun and you want to be a part of it, drop me an email. And if enough people say yes, then maybe I'll put together a workshop proposal. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Can, can I ask a question about Randall's mind smoothing? So in my mind, I don't know if I, I mean, I just want to, to understand your perspective because I, I understand this is not very clear at the moment, but so in my mind, this uh, looks global optimization somehow. Um, you know, thinking about MPC, which is most of our main interest here. Do you think, uh, I mean, if it, let's say that we have a nice implementation with GPU, whatever, the front of mind is moving. Do you think that can still scale for MPC? Or it's something that we should look into large optimization of line? Uh, I don't know. What what are your perspectives about randomized smoothing? Where where this should can bring us? So 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 the, uh, again the idea of randomized smoothing is to deal with no smoothness. If you want to deploy MPC uh, solvers for uh, locomotion, you need that for manipulation too. So I think this is a good tool and uh, which will be explored. So the main issue is computing uh, in parallel several samples, but as soon as you can, you're able to do a parallelization of your algorithm, you, you are fine. And now you have uh, many CPUs which, are, which have many cores. So like if you take a Mac M1 now, which is becoming standard for, uh, for Mac, or M2, it's, you have 20 cores and you can do a lot of things on 20 cores in parallel. So I would say that this is a good thing. And uh, I would say that this is not the most consuming part of the algorithm. Again, if you work with a DDP problem, the, the main part is a, is a backward pass. And so so we have been working a lot on, uh, so this is the work of Sarah el uh, She has been working a lot on improving the efficiency of uh, the linear algebra of Feigen. And so she, she has been able to get a speed up of uh, a division by four of the timings of Feigen. So, by just reworking on the algorithm, on the implementation. So it means that, that this is also something that we should do, in fact, as roboticists to, to, to dive into the, to these topics, to have something which is uh, fulfilling uh, the right, I mean, the, our, our expectation. But uh, I would say that this is a hard problem and we, I mean, uh, there is no training on how to, 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 to write proper code in the community. There is no training on how to understand uh, in, in deep details, uh, how I can work, for instance, and this is something that you, either you are a geek and you, you love to do that and you can dive into it, or uh, it's too complex and you, I mean, and you don't have time in your PhD to, to cover all these topics. And this is also another problem. Thank you for the answer. So I have one more question. Um, 
Do you have any perspective on extending Pinocchio towards flexible multi-body simulations? Uh, flexible mean uh, uh, what do you soft mean? Soft bodies, like dealing with soft bodies. Soft your... bodies. Ah, okay, so uh, I think this won't be the role by Pinocchio, of Pinocchio, but this is the role of, of Sofa. So what we are doing with Sofa people. So Sofa is a is a simulator, a soft body simulator made by uh, Atinria Two. And we are, uh, we, we just have an engineer which will start soon to, to fusion the two frameworks to get rigid body algorithm, rigid body dynamics algorithm within soft bodies and to get the best of both worlds, knowing that working with, uh, soft bodies is, uh, very challenging and, uh, redoing that it's, uh, it takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe in relation to that, I, I would like to know also your perspective on. The use of maximal coordinate versus minimal coordinates in writing multi-body simulators and where do you think we should draw a line because when we look at flexible solvers they tend to use maximal coordinates in your case um, so when you solve closed loops for example you work with implicit constraints which is kind of in between it's not minimal coordinate it's not maximal coordinate in the sense of six times n bodies uh, six times n variables uh, where n is the number of bodies. So where do you think is the right line there? So, uh, yeah, so, so I think the work of uh, Roy Peterson and all of these people at uh, like uh, 40 years ago is still valid today and for robotics is, for rigid body dynamics is very essential and uh, we are still uh, using that and we are just extending the, the, their case to, to modern CPUs. Uh, if you want to deal with uh, maximum coordinate, I think uh, working with uh, with classic CPU is not uh, the right hardware. You should move to uh, to GPUs, and I think this is what Brax is doing, uh, in partly. Uh, so this is uh, the right aspect. But uh, again, um, uh, so people people in so far they are using uh, so maximal coordinates, but because uh, the problem is well written in this formalism, yeah. they suffer a lot. When they have to, to 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 do the Newton step to solve the dynamics problems, and uh, so they need to develop the dedicated Cholesky uh, factorization on sparse matrices, which have a very particular shape, and which take a, yeah, a while to solve. So I would say that for uh, for rigid body dynamics problem and current modern robots, still like kangaroo uh, remains uh, rigid. We still uh, need to to have them, but of course, the future robots should be compliant. So. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but I guess it it, it was is not clear. So when you talk about soft dynamics, if I can mention like this, so will you consider, if I understand what you're saying, will you still consider uh, minimal coordinates, right? Uh, or... I don't. So there, there, there is, I mean, the minimal coordinates of soft body dynamics are maximal coordinates. It's... In the sense of uh, you can explain ex express all the quantities uh, very easily in this frame, and you don't have uh, app constraint between the, the, the bodies, and this is sub constraint because you, you have uh, spring dampers between the different uh, vertices of your mesh. So I mean, uh, I didn't look at it for, uh, fundamentally, but uh, I would say that their choice is good. The problem is much more related to uh, solving contact problems. So when you deal with a soft robots and you have many contacts, thousands of contacts with the, with the ground, for instance, you have a very huge problems. And the question is how you can simplify the problem. And there is some works about simplification of this problem by using uh, machine learning te techniques like uh, PCA for simplifying the problem and, and so on. So I, I, guess, I guess so currently, yeah, people put people in a, in a, in a soft uh, Robotics are looking at uh, advanced method of machine learning to try to reduce and compress the information because you have redundant information into a soft body. Soft body. I don't have anything particular. I'm just really excited to follow all of the software and work. It seems like, you know, just in your whole extended group there is just coming up with things so fast and so awesome. So thank you. And I look forward to, you know, using it and playing around with all the tools. Yeah, so just maybe I, I, I skip one slide at, at the end because of my. Uh, so it, it, I mean, it is the work of many students. So I think it's important to notice. Uh, so all these students have been part of this uh, adventure, and we are also strongly collaborating with uh, Toulouse still. So we are in Paris. So just to mention, if you want to pass by Paris when you go to Icra, you can. Don't hesitate. Uh, 
uh, we are open to to invitation and to have a discussion in general uh, because we are certainly on the path uh, to London uh, for many of you. And uh, yeah, so this is joint collaboration still between two two teams, and we are willing to to open it to many teams and uh, at the European level, or worldwide level, of course. So I put crocodile, for example, which is developed mostly by uh, Carlos now, uh, but uh, there is still still some work to do around it, and we we hope we hope that, for instance, uh, the tools on ProxyDP, ProxyNLP can be uh, can can serve crocodile. Well, I think we're already 20 minutes over technically our one hour time yeah. slot. So we, we should probably wrap it up and, and, and say thank you to Justin for being here. And as Patrick posted in the chat, just a reminder, uh, best paper award nominations are due March 15th. Uh, it should take you less than five minutes to you know submit the title in the quick one paragraph and self nominations are, are strongly encouraged. And just as a, another heads up, we're working on scheduling a TC event uh, at ICRA as well. And probably at future events, there's now a new thing that we're trying to do to get some sort of TC event, some sort of, I don't know, happy hour or something. So uh, look out for that. Uh, and we hope to see you all at these various conferences and workshops and at our next seminar, which is in like a month or so. I don't remember the exact date, um, but we'll send out more information and we'll ping you. And if you're on this webinar, but not on any of our uh, sort of social media or email lists, uh, you can go to our website, uh, our website, which was posted in the chat at the beginning, uh, tcoptrob.org. Um, and there's a way to get on those lists and all those sorts of things. And we can keep you updated on, on all the news from our awesome community. But actually do drop me a link and I will submit a workshop proposal if enough people are interested in doing that on tooling. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for uh, the nice organization and uh, for maintaining the community alive. Yeah, thank you.